Good morning everyone and welcome to church this morning. Now in Kids Own this morning we were talking about fears. I wonder do you have any irrational fears? Uh, I thought I would ask some of our leaders of Kids Own if they have any uh, strange irrational fears, maybe some things that we would get to know them more around. So let's have a listen. Uh, to a few of our kids' own leaders and what they are afraid of. Um, something that I'm afraid of um, is birds flying close to my head um, because I have a fear that they're going to get stuck in my hair and get trapped there. Something that makes me afraid is swans. My most irrational fear has got to be loud noises. Um, I don't like balloons, which makes it difficult at parties. I have to get someone else in the family to take them outside to burst them. And I don't like fireworks. Now I'm getting better at this, but I really have to be a long way away from them. And I have been known to rush members of the family out of a theme park, just so we're not there for the firework display, which they find very annoying. So that's some of our kids own leaders Irrational fears, you could say. Fears that aren't actually going to get them into any harm uh, or those around them, but they're still fears all the same. But I wonder in your house, is there is there some irrational fears? But we all know that fear is very real and there's fears um, that we can um, maybe feel a bit more justified in. And our story today in Kids Own, we could see that the disciples were scared, but it in fairness, it was quite justified, wasn't it? So today our story was about the disciples uh, getting into a boat with Jesus to cross the, the lake. Um, and as they got into the boat, Jesus um, fell asleep and the disciples were getting on with the journey. But as Jesus was sleeping, a storm arose and they were tossed back and forward in the boat and they were starting to get very afraid. And I think that's quite justified. I think I would be slightly scared as well. But they woke Jesus up and they said, Jesus, don't you care that we might drown? And Jesus stood up and he said quite simply, quiet, be still to the waves. And it stopped, just stopped. The wind and the waves obeyed him. And he turned to his friends, his disciples, and he said, why were you so afraid? Do you still not have faith. Do you know, I wonder in that situation, would we have been scared? And do you know, it's not that God expects us not to be afraid, it's maybe how we react to fear. Uh, it has been said, now I haven't counted, that there is over 365 um, references to not being afraid. Um, of not worrying, of fear not, of all those in the Bible. And uh, boys and girls, if you know how many days there are in the year, there's enough there to cover every day of the year. But you know, we all feel fear, but maybe we have to get to know, just like the disciples, did they really not know Jesus well enough that they didn't trust that he would look after them in that storm? Do we know what God well enough? so that our faith and our relationship with God changes how we react to fear, boys and girls. So it's, we are gonna feel frightened and I'm afraid as you get older, our fears only increase sometimes. But it's actually, how do we react to that fear? Do we trust God instead? Uh, there's a, a verse in First John that talks about perfect love casts out all fear and yeah, maybe we just get to know God more to deal with our fears. And in Kids Zone today, we, we set you a wee prayer activity. Um, and I've done mine as well. And we've asked you to get a bit of paper and to write down some of your worries. Um, and they're all, everybody's going to have different fears and different worries. Mine's here are work and family health. I've got uh, a few more that I could definitely list. But what we're asking you to do is today hand those fears over and adults we can do this too just to lift up those fears to God and and react to them differently because we know he loves us and we, you all got your wee post-it notes in your pack today and we're just going to stick 
those hearts over our fears, hand them over to the Lord and trust that he is in control no matter what. So I'm just going to pray before we hand over to Sam. Father God, we thank you that you love us. Uh, we thank you that you walk with us every day. And God, I pray for each one of us as we think about the things that bring us fear, that bring us anxiety. Lord, that we would trust you with it. Not that um, necessarily fear is going to leave us sometimes, but actually how we react to that fear will change because we know who loves us and we know that you, God, are in control. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you to Donna for getting us off to such a great start this morning. And you're most welcome to our worship. If you're here for the first time, uh, wonderful to have you. If you're joining us regularly, it is a delight to have you uh, coming together as the body of Christ, although dispersed at this time. We are continuing our series Worship in the Wilderness with a spirit-led journey this morning and Danielle is going to be speaking on that theme. On Friday morning at 8am we have our Lent prayer times and we'd love you to join us for those. The General Register of Vestry members is open until the 9th of March and if you've never signed up before and you'd like to, please do get the form from the website or contact myself or Danielle and we'll get you a form to sign. It means you can join in our annual vestry and vote at it later in the year. And the new website is now live and we've already had some great comments about it. Thank you again to Pete Mina for all the fantastic work that he's done on that. On Wednesday evenings, our home groups will be meeting. They're following the theme of worship in the wilderness. Uh, and if you aren't part of a home group, I really encourage you to join one. Uh, with the church being dispersed, home groups more important than ever. And we'd love as many people as possible to be joining up. And the beginning of Lent, the first Lenten study of worship in the wilderness is a great time to join. Again, speak to the clergy or indeed to Bill or Karen Welsh. Also on Wednesday evenings, our bishop, Bishop George Davison, is continuing his Lent talks, Faith in Tough Times, and that's at seven o'clock on the Connor Facebook, YouTube and website and lots of other places as well. So a uh, great start uh, looking at the prophet Habakkuk and his heartfelt prayers last Wednesday, and you can indeed catch up with that. Just also want to encourage you that if there are any pastoral needs or indeed anybody's going into hospital that you know of, uh, we do appreciate being contacted and having the opportunity uh, to let chaplains know or provide support by phone at this time. So uh, please do indeed do that. And as we now begin our worship, we reflect on John 4 and verse 24. Jesus said, God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we come together to journey with Jesus during this season of Lent, to worship in the wilderness, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that on our journey we may be led by the presence of the Holy Spirit as we serve Christ and know the greatness of his love. Let us then invite the Spirit to lead us as we open the way for him by confessing our sins. We say together, Almighty God, 
we confess that we have sinned against you, for we have denied your saving presence in our lives. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Come to us in the fire of your love and set our minds on the way of the Spirit, that we may bear his fruit in love and joy and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus came to bring fullness of life to every possible dimension of our lives. He said in John 10 and verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This new life or transformation is for the whole person, our spirit, souls and bodies, to be made whole by the coming of the Lord Jesus. And so I pray, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. And a special prayer for us as we journey with Jesus. God of feasting and fasting, mountaintop and desert, you gather us together by your spirit. May we follow Jesus in the wilderness, feeding on your living bread and tasting your water of life. We come to you hungry and thirsty for more of you, God. Amen. After the next song, Jane Martin and Matthew Kearns are going to read our Bible readings. And the next song, such a, a wonderful song on this series, Blessed Be Your Name, Blessed Be Your Name, where your streams of abundance flow. And equally, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name, Lord. Let's stand and sing our praises to God. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in that desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your. 
Testament reading is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 1 to 5 and 15 to 18. Be careful to obey all the commands I am giving you today. Then you will live and multiply and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all these 40 years, your clothes did not wear out and your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. Do not forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions, where it was so hot and dry. He gave you water from the rock. He fed you with manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and test you for your own good. He did this so you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfil the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. This morning's New Testament reading is taken from Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. The Baptism and Testing of Jesus At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us on this uh, second journey in our new series, Worship in the Wilderness. Sam kicked off the first journey for us on Ash Wednesday with a secret journey, and this morning we're thinking about what it means to be on a Spirit-led journey. So you bow your head with me and pray as we ask God the Spirit to come and lead us now. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for who you are and for what you do in our lives, for how you guide us, for how you lead us through. And I pray that you'll be with each and every one of us in our homes today, whether we're alone or whether we're surrounded by family. Would you stir in our hearts, Lord? that you might refine our faith in these times. So we pray, Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher and our guide today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. About 18 months ago, I had um, the joy of going to a, a leaders conference in Sligo. And I'd been there before. It happens every few years. I'd been um, to my first one a few years before that. So I was really looking forward to the second one. I'd kind of got the feel of what it was about and what it would be like. Um, it takes place in, in a hotel in Sligo, um, which is really nice and tranquil and, and just some good headspace. So I'd been before. I knew where the hotel was and, and what the score was. So I drove down to Sligo, set off with my sat nav and it got me, um, Google Maps safely got me uh, to Sligo. And when I got to Sligo town, it started to tell me to go left. 
and I knew that I needed to go right to the hotel. So I turned the sat nav down and went where I knew. I knew where I was at this stage. It was slightly orientated at that stage. So I drove to the hotel. I got to the hotel, got my luggage, went into the reception and went to book in. And the girl said, I'm sorry, we don't have a booking in your name. So I think, well, you must do, because I've definitely booked and it was all part of this package. So I thought, well, I'll get out my ticket and show her. And I said, no, it's, I'm definitely booked in. I'm part of the, the leaders conference. Um, she said, I'm not, I'm not sure what that conference is. So I pulled out my ticket um, for booking to prove that I had booked the room. And she looked at the ticket and she said, I think you're in the wrong hotel. Entirely mortified that my sat nav was actually taking me to the right place. I ignored it and went to the wrong hotel. Entirely mortified, I picked up my suitcase and left very quickly, wishing that I'd listened to my sat nav. I was really confident about where I was going. I was pretty sure this, this is the right way. And I got it wrong because I chose not to listen to the sat nav guiding me. What do we do and where do we turn in life when we find ourselves in an in a unknown territory and we don't know where to turn. We don't know where to go. What do we do in the wilderness when we don't know where to go? Who is our guide and, and how, do we, how do we work out our way through the wilderness? This morning, we are on a spirit-led journey. As the spirit guides us through the wilderness, we're going to think about the two passages that Jane and Matthew read for us as we tune in to how God guides us in the wilderness. How is better than the voice of a satnav that I could turn down and ignore? But if we tune into the voice of the Spirit, he will lead us in the wilderness. And as we explore this idea of, of a Spirit-led journey, there are three truths that we need to hold on to this morning to wrestle with how to navigate our way through a wilderness season in our lives. The three truths that I want us to explore this morning are these that we are led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Secondly, that wilderness is not a sign of God's absence. And then thirdly, the truth that wilderness is actually a place of transformation. So we're going to look at those three truths this morning and, and really try to take hold of them in our hearts. So let's explore this idea first, that we are led by the Spirit into the wilderness. The American author and preacher B.B. Taylor uh, once wrote this. For many people, the hardest thing to believe in the wilderness is that God has anything to do with it at all. I'm sure that's a feeling most of us could identify with. She writes, it can feel like the exact opposite, as if God has vanished and you have been turned over to the enemy. But according to the Gospel of Mark, it was the Spirit who drove Jesus into the wilderness. Not the devil or the world, but the Holy Spirit of God. It is the Spirit of God who leads us into the wilderness. Most of us will probably feel if we're in a wilderness season now, that it's because we've taken a wrong turn or because we've we've sinned in some way, because we have failed God and, and now he is, he's punishing us by sending us away into the wilderness. Perhaps you feel like that today. Perhaps you're feeling a, experiencing a wilderness or a dark night of the soul and, and you feel that it's because you've made a mistake somewhere. You failed or, or let God down. Without doubt, there are dark times in our lives um, that we experience because of our choices and because we walk away from God, because we turn our back on him. But among Christians, more often than not, we find ourselves in the wilderness because God has led us there, because God has brought us to the wilderness. And that's what we see in the Bible. We see the Holy Spirit lead people into the wilderness. We see it in the Old Testament, in, in the story of the Israelites that, that Jane reminded us of. And we see it in the New Testament, the story of Jesus that Matthew read for us this morning. And Jesus begins his ministry kind of in a similar way to the Israelites in Exodus. He passes through waters, not now not through the Red Sea the way the Israelites did, but he passes through the waters of baptism in the Jordan River. 
And in that passage uh, that Matthew read, those, those couple of verses, you can imagine how exciting that was. It's this mountaintop experience for Jesus. God is confirming who he is. He goes into the waters of baptism. The Spirit of God descends on him like a dove and then the voice of the Father speaks. And he speaks in affirmation and devotion and he says, You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Imagine being Jesus at that moment when he goes to baptism and suddenly the heavens opened and God affirms who he is. And you might expect that after this high point for Jesus that he would then launch into another mountaintop experience that he would launch into this really exciting and dynamic um, preaching ministry coming and demonstrating that the kingdom of God is near. And yet that's not what happens. He's, he's not surrounded by people. He's not preaching the gospel energetically to people. But instead, like Israel, like the Israelites before him, Jesus goes from the waters to the wilderness. He goes from a season of spiritual feasting and excitement to a struggle of fasting. He goes from a, a period of affirmation, confirmation, to a time of loneliness and temptation. In Mark, we read that at once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever experienced moments where you thought God was calling you, sending you, empowering you, that he had chosen you for a particular ministry or, or way of serving and you're confident of your purpose? And then suddenly you find yourself in a setback. Suddenly disappointment lands itself at your door. Times of refreshment and excitement followed immediately by a period of, of dryness and I don't know what to do now. If you've experienced that, I want you to know that it's what God often does for his people. He confirms a purpose in their hearts and then, and then he takes them into the wilderness to test it and to confirm it, to prove that it's true. So if that's you and you have found yourself in that, that situation before where you were so sure of what you could do for God and then find yourself in the wilderness suddenly, take heart because you're following in the footsteps of Jesus. Wilderness is the place that the Spirit leads us to. The Father led Jesus into the desert by the Spirit and the Father leads us into the wilderness by the Spirit. So we've arrived here, we've arrived in the wilderness, the Spirit has led us here and, and we're, we're getting to grips with that. But what now? What do we do now that we're here? I remember um, before I trained for, for ministry, I, I was working in a primary school and there was a child in my class who really hated school. Uh, it was a particular phase for a few weeks where he just hated that initial coming into school in the mornings. He just did not want to do it. And so his mum and I worked out this little plan that she would bring him right in, right into the classroom, leave him at the door, and then I would distract him, kind of pick him up, and then close the door. And then she would make her get away. As I closed the door, she would leave very quickly. And he would be distracted for a moment. He would be distracted by whatever I, whatever toy or, or activity I'd given him or by his friends. And then it would dawn on him. He would realise she's gone. She's left me here. And for the next five or 10 minutes, he um, he would cry, he would go to the window with his hands and his face pressed up to the window, watching her walk across the car park to the car and, and drive out. And he would cry his eyes out, knowing that she had left him there. And that was so heart-wrenching to watch. Some of us are feeling that that's what God does to us in a wilderness, that he leads us into this barren desert and then he leaves us. And he says, I'll be back in a few months to see how you get on. But that is not the case. It's not the case that God leaves us. Because the second truth that we need to grasp today is this. That wilderness is not a sign of God's absence. Wilderness is not a sign of God's absence. The people of Israel experienced a huge mountaintop experience. They had they'd been in, in slavery in Egypt. And then suddenly they were released 
And then as they left, God parted the Red Sea in front of them. Imagine that scene. Literally, you come to an ocean and, and God parts it. And he lets them walk through the sea. And as they pass through it, he begins to close the sea and destroys their enemies. Imagine how incredible that must have been, knowing God's favour in that moment. And so they celebrated with joyful worship and dancing and, and playing instruments. They were on top of the world and they probably had hopes and dreams for the promised land. So they thought, we leave slavery. We walk through this sea that he has parted for us straight into the promised land, straight into the goodness of God. And that will be amazing. Very quickly in Exodus chapter 15, what we realise is that they don't find themselves in the promised land. They find themselves in the desert. And the desert they come to at first is a place with no fresh water. And in that place, their joy and their celebration turns to grumbling. Their worship turns to distrust and they immediately doubt that God is with them. They think, well, he's abandoned us then. In chapter 16, they reach another desert and they discover there that there's no food. And they begin to long for their days in Egypt. They begin to think, actually, we were, we were better off in slavery. And they begin to complain that they're going to die because there's no food and, and no resources for them. And yet they weren't abandoned in those deserts because what we see in both deserts is that God provides them with fresh water and with fresh manna. And when we experience the struggles of wilderness, we need to not see those times as punishments from God or signs that God is uncaring towards us or non-existent or that he has left us. But we need to see that wilderness is just an opportunity for God to test our hearts. The question God asks in the wilderness is, do you trust yourself or do you trust me? Do you trust yourself? Or do you trust me? The passage that Jane read for us from Deuteronomy reflects on the story of the Israelites in the wilderness. And it says, he gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known. To humble and test you. So that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. God has a very specific purpose in the wilderness. What he confirms on the mountaintop, he tests in the wilderness. And he operates in the wilderness because it's the one place where we are desperate. It's the place where, where he can get our attention. It's the place where we can't be distracted by so many worldly things. It's the place where we can't store up treasure for ourselves, resources. It's the place that God takes us to get our attention. It's the place that we can't survive without him. Desperate times produce desperate prayers. And so in this... The season of wilderness, it's God's desire, not that we would learn to be satisfied in, in what resources we have or can produce for ourselves, but his desire is that in the season of wilderness, we would be satisfied in what God provides here and now, today. In the, the daily bread, in the manna from heaven each day that he provides for us. And so we need to learn in the wilderness that it's not about just getting through. It's not about getting your head down and just getting through these next few weeks or months. Our hope does not rest in God bringing us out of the wilderness, but our hope is found in the fact that he meets us right here in the centre of the wilderness, that he is with us, that he is present with us. Because it's not on the mountaintop that we learn to worship, but it's in the wilderness that we really learn to rely on his promise. The promise that he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. It's in the wilderness that we prove that promise to be true, that he never leaves us or forsakes us or abandons us. 
Why can't we just enjoy his presence and his provision on the mountaintop? Why can't the Christian life just be a mountaintop party all the time? Why doesn't God want that for us? Just to be celebrating all the time. The American evangelist Billy Graham once said this, mountaintops are for views and inspiration, but fruit is grown in the valleys. Mountaintops are for views and inspiration, but fruit is grown in the valleys. The same principle is applied to the wilderness. Because our third truth this morning is that wilderness is a place of transformation. The wilderness is a place of transformation. Ultimately, as we explored last Sunday, the wilderness is the place that God takes us so that we might learn to worship. It's what he says to Moses to pass on to Pharaoh, that worship in the wilderness is what he desires. But as we discovered uh, over the last um, couple of sessions, the last Sunday and on Ash Wednesday, worship in the wilderness looks different to worship on the mountaintop. Because in the wilderness, we have no control. As we just talked about it in the wilderness, our distractions are removed. And so we must learn to worship differently. We must be changed as worshippers. We must be transformed as worshippers. And it's in the moments when we feel like we've come to the edge of ourselves, when, when we have no more and we don't know what, what next, where do we turn now? It's in that moment when we come to the edge of ourselves that a whole new level of faith is possible. That a whole new way of worship and a whole new level of worship is possible. Anyone who has ever taken up a new exercise program like Couch to 5K or, or something like that, or maybe embarked on some kind of diet, it's done in the hopes of transforming themselves physically. That's why people embark on those things, to, to look and feel better. But if you've ever done either of those things, taken up an exercise program or, or embarked on a diet, you'll know how much hard work it is. You'll know how painful at times it is. But people do it and, and complete it in the hopes of change, in the hope of being transformed by the end of it. The reality is that it's in the most difficult or, or challenging times of our lives that we have the most potential to be transformed by God there's the most potential for our character and our faith to be shaped and molded just as God wills and desires for us. Our faith has the potential to be strengthened in the most painful times if we are open to the possibility of transformation, if we're willing to engage with God and we are willing to be teachable in the wilderness. It's the place that God can mold us to, to really refine what it is we believe to really refine how we worship and to really refine our faith. The Israelites literally had everything stripped away from them. Food and water, some of the most essential basic things and those things were stripped away from them. And God did that so that they would be truly dependent on God. Because it's in really painful, difficult times that we learn to trust in the promises of God. That God refines us in those moments. James chapter 1 in the New Testament says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We can be mature in Christ, not lacking anything if we're willing to put in the work in a time of wilderness, if we're willing to be transformed during really painful, difficult times. Romans 5 says something similar. It says, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. He has been given to us. I want you to know that your wilderness is not an accident, nor will it be wasted. Because God always wants to use our wilderness as an opportunity and a time for transformation in our lives. 
don't know if you've had the opportunity to listen to some of our young people in metal share their wilderness stories on on facebook and on instagram if you haven't i recommend that you do some really powerful stories of how god has transformed our young people when they went through difficulty and when some of their um, most prized possessions and priorities were stripped away. We've been living very busy lives and if we're honest, there's not a lot of room for God to speak at times. And now we find ourselves in the wilderness when most of life has been stripped away from us. But this, is, this wilderness is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to receive from God to receive just enough for each day to really go back to depend on him. And God knows that for us to grow in him that we might have to start putting away some things that he might have to strip some things away from us. And the best place to do that is in the wilderness. And so by his spirit, he leads us into the wilderness. And it's there that we'll have empty hands, hands that are ready to receive from him, hands that are free to worship him. And so I want to encourage you in this time of wilderness, if you find yourself there now, that it's not a place of punishment. It's not a place where God has abandoned you, but it's actually a place that God has brought you because he wants to transform you. He wants to test and, and refine your faith. And so I want you to know today if you're in the wilderness, that, that God is with you. He never wants to see you suffer in the wilderness, but he is passionate to see you trust him in the wilderness, to be transformed into the likeness of Christ and to learn what it is to worship, to truly worship in the wilderness when everything else is stripped away. Israel was transformed through her wilderness worship and you and I can be too. In a moment, we're going to sing the song Oceans together. And I just want to read um, the verse uh, or the, the words of the chorus in, in this song before we come to sing it. And I really hope that we can use it as our prayer this Lent. Let this be our prayer. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Saviour. Let's just pray this morning. Lord, I thank you that you have a, a very clear purpose in the wilderness. That you lead us there by your spirit. You don't abandon us there, but you lead us. That you go with us, you go before us. And you provide for us there. And Lord, I just thank you that it's the place for our faith to be refined, for character, for perseverance and for hope to be cultivated. And so I pray for each and every person facing the wilderness today, that by your spirit you would do that. Lord, would you transform it? Would you transform it from a place of, of suffering and on what we perceive to be abandonment? And would you make it a place where we are tested, where we are refined and where we triumph in you. So I pray that you would come by your spirit and, and do your work among us, whatever it is you desire and will to do in each of our lives in this time of wilderness. And that our, pre our faith would be made stronger in the presence of our Saviour. Amen. No 
oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you So
Thanks to the music group for leading us in oceans and to Danielle for that message of transformation, of being led by the Spirit. May we all take it to heart and learn from that wonderful message. And now we're going to declare our faith in God in the words of this creed. We believe in God the Father, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We believe in Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the King of kings, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. We believe in the Spirit, giver of many gifts, proceeding from the throne on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And in our prayers today, as we pray for that transformation of the Spirit, after I say the words Holy Spirit, I invite you to reply, fill our lives today. Let us pray. Almighty God, who sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church, open our hearts to the riches of your grace, that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love and joy and peace. We pray for a fresh anointing of your Spirit for all your people as we worship you in the wilderness of this time. Lead us to new and deeper experiences of you through silence, fasting, lament or giving to others. Holy Spirit, fill our lives today. Our Father God, we thank you for Jesus, who was a walking example of what a man anointed with the Spirit can accomplish as he endured 40 days and nights of temptation in the wilderness. Thank you for the price that he paid for us to receive the gift of new life, of being alive in Christ. Thank you that every life can be changed from the inside out when sin is confessed and through repentance and faith. Come, Lord Jesus, and make us alive in you now, full of your abundant life. Holy Spirit, fill our lives today. Lord God, you have called your apostles and saints to be men and women of faith, who stand tall through times of struggle and hardship, who pray for the transformation of nations and communities through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that we may be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, that the church may be bold in making the wonder of salvation known and in sharing the truth that coming alive through Christ is the greatest change that can take place in any person's life. Holy Spirit, fill our lives today. Lord Jesus, you taught your disciples the power of prayer, and day by day you met the sick, the poor and the lost. We pray for those who are laid up, by illness or injury, in hospital or at home. Bless them and may they receive your presence and healing. For the poor and the lost, we pray for the transformation of their whole lives, body, soul and spirit. And as they meet with you, Lord Jesus, give them your help, hope and new life. Holy Spirit, fill our lives today. Holy Spirit, breathe your power over this land. Speak your word powerfully to bring change, hope and new life. 
whether we are walking through the wilderness or where the streams of abundance flow, may the good news of the cross be our help and strength. We pray for trust in Jesus to increase everywhere and that after the hardness of winter, a springtime of growth follows when faith and worship blossom. Holy Spirit, fill our lives today. And so we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Holy Spirit, fill us with your water of life, so that even as we walk through the desert, we might know your refreshing and share it with those around us. Lead us, as you led Jesus, to the glory of God the Father and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you for joining us once again and uh, do join us for prayer on Friday morning uh, and indeed next Sunday morning when we'll be thinking about a simple journey as we continue this series of worship in the wilderness. And we're going to finish with uh, a wonderful uh, rendition of when I survey the wondrous cross, may you be blessed as you join in singing this glorious hymn.